trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Before we go to the episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor, CapChase. Imagine that you could get access to the revenues you'll generate in the next 12 months already today. What would it mean for you? CapChase helps fast-growing recurring revenue companies finance growth without taking on debt or dilution. Whether you want to invest in growth or R&D, CapChase turns your predictable revenue into growth capital today. CapChase has helped founders unlock hundreds of millions in financing to fuel their growth and on average extend their runway by eight months and spared upwards of 16% dilution. So go see how insanely easy it is by clicking the link in the show notes or go to capchase.com slash slush to learn more. Thanks. Let's go to the episode. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Paal, and with me in the studio today, Isak Rautio. Hi, Isak. Hi, William and camera. <laughs> and uh, today, hi, hello also to the to the guest, uh, Roxanne Varsa. Welcome to the Soaked by Slush podcast. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. Super nice to to have you join. Pleasure. Um, yeah, we usually start off with uh, a short introduction uh, on our guests. So do you want to tell the listeners and viewers who you are? Yeah, sure. So um, I am today the director of Station F, which is the world's biggest startup campus based in Paris. Um, but you can probably hear that I did not grow up in France. So I'm actually from the US and have been living uh, out in Europe for the last 11 years. And I'm just passionate about the ecosystem. So I've been involved in a lot of different uh, projects, even outside of Station F, doing a little bit of investing, scouting for a couple of funds, um, supporting uh, women in tech through a lot of different initiatives, and uh, in a past life, also getting people to talk about failure. So I think those are pretty much where I, where I stand. How did you end up there? At Station F in yes. France? Where? Where exactly? Paris. In Paris, Paris and Station is, F, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, uh, it's hard to explain because I've just always been in love with France and you sometimes just can't explain love. But I actually came out here to do a master's degree. Um, it feels like a lifetime ago. And I fell in love with this ecosystem because I just felt there was so much to build here. And so that's why I decided to stay. Yeah, it's not the the most common path being an American in Europe and leading the the startup campus, especially in France. So it's an interesting, <laughs> interesting tra- trajectory uh, for sure. Uh, but yeah, maybe just diving into the topic, um, what do you think is the biggest difference between American and, un, and, and European entrepreneurs? You know, things evolve so much. Uh, when I moved out here, I remember people were like, you're from Palo Alto, you love startups, you're going the wrong direction, like turn around and go back where you came from. Today, that has changed a lot. Today, actually, it's it's more the opposite. People reaching out to me from uh, the US, from Silicon Valley saying, hey, um, things are not what they used to be, have changed a lot. Paris looks incredible. We can see that now people are building incredible companies there. So So how can we come? So I feel actually um, the mindset and the culture has changed dramatically. So maybe 10 years ago, we would have said like um, entrepreneurs here are not ambitious enough or the investors are too risk averse. That is definitely not the case today. So I don't know really what the difference is anymore. The gap has has closed. Do you what do you think has happened within those 10 years? Is it is it mainly something uh, going wrong in Palo Alto or or California and and something going right in Paris? What's going on? What a, what a sneaky question. Um, <laughs> no, I think it, I think it's you know I think it's a little bit of both. If I'm perfectly honest, I think a lot has gone right uh, in France and in Paris so far. Um, and I also think it, it's not just Paris when we're talking about innovation in, in France. Obviously, there's a lot of great stuff happening out of out of Paris as well. Um, but I think it's kind of been a collective effort from the government, from the startup ecosystem, um, you know, to really kind of address some of the pain points. I think entrepreneurship was not top of mind for a young graduate when I first moved out here. Today, I think you have over 50%, probably over 70% of graduates that want to start or join uh, startup companies. 
Um, I think you also have, you know, you've done, the government has done a lot to attract international talent, make the visas more simple, um, help international investors kind of come and set up here. So I think there's really a lot going on. And then I think if you look at what's been going on in Silicon Valley, I think the prices have been exploding. It's really expensive to start a company. I think people have different attitudes and opinions on what's going on culturally. Is it a place that people want to live, uh, given some of the things that they've been experiencing? So I think, you know, now, especially with COVID, that kind of make a lot of people readdress what they're doing. We're seeing a huge shift and it's been very exciting to see. Yeah, no, for sure. We can see the same shift also in in Finland uh, in the past 10 years. And I think one thing that comes up quite frequently is also that there are now much more role models in Europe as well. Uh, The US had a a strong culture of of really cool companies starting from the 70s, from the 80s already. And and in the Europe, uh, here in Europe, it it hasn't been the case uh, in to the same extent at least so now there's like cool stories with spotify and supercell in finland and, and lots of different uh, companies so the, uh, it, it seems like europe is catching up in in that sense but are there some things you know um that you could transfer from the us still to the europe uh, or to the, to europe that could be could be beneficial for the european ecosystem Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think you you actually hit it on the head. I think we're starting now to have a bit of a mature ecosystem and a lot of the experience that we were lacking previously is actually now available. Um, But I was actually talking with somebody who's actually relocated uh, back to France from the U.S. who said, you know, the one thing that we're still missing is that exit experience um, in our ecosystem. You have people uh, in the U.S. when you, especially in Silicon Valley, you know, he said, you know, I go to any party or any cafe and I'm surrounded by people who have, you know, sold their business, IPO'd. And here it's still relatively rare to come by those profiles. We can we can probably count them um, across all of Europe still on, on our hands and feet. <laughs> uh, can you, is there such a thing as an American entrepreneurial ethos and European entrepreneurial ethos? Has it seeped into a sort of collective mindset or something? Like, is there is there a difference? I, I remember I read something before this episode and like one uh, major difference in terms of attitude, mindset, philosophy, whatever, uh, is money, uh, which that was interesting. Uh, can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, actually, when you ask this question, that is actually the only thing that really comes to mind um, is the way that we talk about money. And I don't know if it's European or if it's French, because I think I'm just much more familiar No, I with felt the- a little bit dirty even asking that question. So it's probably more European. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. All right. So then we have a, an understanding that it's it's across Europe. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, the the way that entrepreneurs will talk about money in the U.S., I mean, it's just not a taboo topic to say I'm going after billions. Uh, you know, I want to sell my company. You just talk about it, which is like it's not even a topic, really. And here I have literally never come across an entrepreneur that has talked to me about their business with that as maybe it is top of mind, but it's just never expressed as such. So I just don't hear the topic of um, money unless we're talking about, you know, unicorns and the valuation, but it's not like I personally want to get rich. That's just not something I hear. What's your hunch? Do you think that's a tangible benefit? What, that we're not talking about it? No, the opposite. Or, I mean, any either way, either way around. What, do you think that affects something tangible? Um, it's really hard to say. I mean, I do have to say, I mean, I've been out here long enough that I'm just used to it and I find it normal that we don't talk about (laughs) it. So actually when people are talking to me about like, you know, I'm trying to get rich with my company, I'm a little bit like, Ooh, what's your motivation (laughs) for that? Um, Suspicious. Yeah. yeah, I think I I don't think that it's it's a really big game changer as long as because I really think, you know, when you're building a company, you you're in it for the long run. And I do find I wonder if money is really a long term motivation. I think it really has to be something more than that. Yeah, I think that mindset might actually set up Europe quite nicely for the next 20 years where we have to build <clears throat> also companies that are going to have a big impact and, and solve uh, really big issues. And it's very good to not be driven by by only money uh, at that point, I feel. So maybe maybe the next wave of really cool uh, unicorns come from Europe uh, because of that mindset. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, let's talk more about Station F. Um, do you want to tell the listeners a bit more what you do. What, what, what is Station F and how did it become the, the biggest uh, startup campus in the world? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so Station F, we have now been up and running for a little over four years. So actually, it still feels like we've just started. Um, but this is a, uh, so we call it a startup campus just because there's so many different components. Um, essentially, if you want to think about it like a startup university, I think that's really the most uh, applicable. We have 30 different startup programs. Um, they cover a lot of different verticals, uh, development stages, um, and they're run by different organizations. So one third by corporates, one third by universities. We have some top universities at Station F. Um, and one third run by organizations like Entrepreneur First, for example, has their, their French program at Station F. Um, and we have 1,000 companies taking part in these programs at any given time. And it's pretty selective. We, Depending on the program, we tend to select something like 6 to 9% of companies that apply. So um, pretty hard to get in. And we also really want to show with Station F, I mean, this is really about helping people get up and running. So it's early stage companies that we're addressing primarily. Um, but also... Diversity is really a key component um, and has been from day one. So we have one third of our population that is coming from outside of France. And actually, a lot of people don't expect this, but the countries that are the best represented are the U.S., China, uh, uh, South Korea, I think is pretty high up on the list as well. So it's not necessarily our European neighbors that are the best uh, represented. I don't really know why. Um we also have a lot of female founders. Um, so we actually have a few programs where it's over 45% of the founders that are female, which is higher than industry average. And we also have developed a program that's dedicated to people from underprivileged background. So we have actually had people building companies that have formerly lived on the street. We have somebody who's been a formerly a prisoner, uh, people who are refugees, no higher education. So all kinds of backgrounds. And it's just incredible to see what they're building, the problems they're addressing, how they're building their companies. But the point of Station F is really to simplify building your company, getting it up and running. So in addition to campus where we have all our programs and resources, we also have a housing extension for people who are seeking flexible and inexpensive housing. That's amazing. Uh, what, uh, what are some of the sort of uh, programs. I mean, you talked a lot about like uh, those uh, support programs, but I mean, I guess this is a bigger question of of how can you can you train entrepreneurship? Uh, That's a you... super question. Um, I think I think you can teach some elements of it, but I do also really think some of it is just character, drive, motive. I mean, those are things. How do you teach? Teach that. Um, and also, I think that people need to feel connected to the problem that they're addressing. So a lot of the times when people are just building something um, to address an opportunity that they've seen, I do question how long are you going to be able to just hang on to this? You know, you really I think you really have to feel the pain that you're going after. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, yeah, I've always been a bit skeptic, uh, skeptical of the entrepreneurship programs at universities and stuff like that. It seems like it's more you need the more tangible um, benefits or tangible experiences to actually learn what entrepreneurship is, to, to actually learn how to build something. It's You can't read it from a book, or at least you can't only read it from a book. You also need to, to apply it in the real world as opposed to maybe something something um, something more, um, you know, less tangible at least. Uh, exactly. But, so actually, just yeah. to, to tag onto the back of that, the programs are not really about teaching entrepreneurship. It's much more we're selecting for majority of programs, companies that have already been formed with a prototype, with a team, and we're essentially accelerating their business, helping them find new customers, helping them perfect their product. So it's really about getting those resources in front of them. I think teaching entrepreneurship is probably one step earlier, um, which is something that, you know, we may do someday. Yeah, exactly. What, what is the benefit for a company uh, to join this kind of a community and, and um, a centralized hub of, of like-minded people? Uh, what, what does a company in this very early stage get out of it? I think you just said it yourself. <laughs> it's a big community. Um, I think it's, you know, when you're starting a company, we see all these headlines about unicorns and like mega rounds of funding. That is definitely not the early days of building a company and people forget how hard it is. Um, and so this is this is really about being surrounded by people who can help you with some of the big challenges and big questions you're going to be faced with in the early days. So I think there's a lot of reasons that people come to Station F. I mean, I think it's a great place to work. You feel good when you're in the building. Um, 
we're very visible. A lot of people come because it's super visible. We get people from literally everywhere around the world. I We joke about it a lot a lot, but we actually have an example from Finland um, of people, you know, you want to meet somebody in your home country, there's a good chance you'll meet them if you come to Station F on campus. <laughs> so we actually had a, a company from Finland called uh, Maya Maya, and they wanted to meet the mayor of Helsinki, and they actually met them at Station F by complete accident. Now they're doing a, a great project with the city of Helsinki. But I think those are the kind of examples, but the real value of being at Station F is actually all the entrepreneurs sitting around you that can answer your questions because they've already experienced that pain. Can you take us on a bit of a ver- uh, imaginary tour? Like, what does it look like when you, let's say, come in from the front door? Like, what is it like? How do how does the community happen? Well, man, I've never had to like describe, I just, I won't do justice to it. Um, It's huge. First of all, people always tell me like, I've seen the photos, but it looks really big when you actually get here. Um, It's a, it's a historical monument. So it's actually a building that's a former freight station that was converted um, It's from the 1920s. And so I think that's also kind of, it. it's a great story because we have um, a famous French entrepreneur that initially created the building and it's now been repurposed. And so I think it has a great entrepreneurial vibe, but also so I feel it respects France and reflects France very well um, in, in the project. And so people, yeah, when they're here, they actually feel, they tell me a lot of time, we don't feel like we're in France. We hear tons of different languages. Um, you know, we have just recently set up a beta bar uh, at the entrance. So when you walk into the building, you can actually see some of the different crazy products that people are working on at Station F. Um, we have some massive event spaces. We have a huge cinema-like auditorium. And then we have um, the building cut into three different zones. So the first zone, you'll have a lot of events and services. The second part of the building, the middle zone, that's where we actually have the 1,000 startups that are working. And it's pretty hard to get into this part of the building because we have to let the companies work. So actually, people are always like, why can't I visit? Why can't I go? But actually, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a tourist site. It's for people to work. And then the last part of the building, which is open to the public, is a massive restaurant um, with like five kitchens, two bars. I think they do like 3,000 to 10,000 meals per day. So it's huge. And uh, that's just because we love food. But people have also discovered entrepreneurship through the restaurant. People have come being like, I heard you have a big restaurant. And they're like, oh, what is going on next door? So I think that's um, that's another really great uh, aspect about about the space. Yeah. Is there any reason for a company not to join a community like Station F or or an incubator? Uh, Like what kind of companies um, would not benefit from it that much? Sure. So I actually think, you know, we are, (laughs) I hate to say it like this, we're asking people kindly to leave (laughs) at, um, you know, about two or three years in because we, first of all, I mean, we need to be here to help people get started. And usually if your business is still up and running after two years, that is a good sign. And you should go and develop your business in a space with your brand, with your identity. It's it's probably less relevant to be in a, in a shared space at that point. Um, the other thing is, I mean, earlier that we're getting companies today that they're showing up at Station F usually when they have a team, um, you know, a couple people, they have a product, a prototype. If you're earlier than that, coming to a place like Station F to work on a regular basis probably makes less sense. Um, The community definitely has value, but there's different ways that you can get involved in the community. And we'll be actually launching some new new things for people to get involved in the community in the upcoming weeks. But it doesn't make sense to actually show up every day and build your company on site at that stage. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I would, yeah, it would be interesting. You you mentioned uh, more specific programs. You have like um, the underprivileged program and the, the um, uh, female founders um, heavy programs. So, I'm just curious, uh, how do you go about attracting uh, people to the programs? Since there seems to be a, a bit of a chicken egg problem as well, where you know there's a certain stereotype, or maybe not that much anymore, but there's like some some characters and some people from some some backgrounds that maybe are more drawn into entrepreneurship and then there's kind of a uh, problem to to attract people who could be really really uh, good at it but uh, just kind of no no way for for them to to get in into places so kind of what 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 has been the uh, the success story behind or or the yeah the, the most efficient ways to to attract these uh, these kinds of other uh, other groups of of uh, entrepreneurs to to join 
Yeah, I would. I mean, you've hit it on the head. It's they, they're not people that are necessarily on, you know, all the regular entrepreneurship platforms. Um, and they may not even know that they what they're doing could become a startup, um, which is why we have different selection criteria for them as well. They don't need to come with a team. They don't need to come with a prototype. They just need to show us that they have done something with their idea. So sometimes people will show up with like, I have a massive Facebook community around, you know, this idea that I have or this passion that I have, what do I do with it? And so I think those are, those are the kind of stories that um, we're, we're often looking at in the fighters program, but actually how do we get those people in the door in the first place? It's a lot about network and it's not your traditional startup VC networks. Of course, it's actually, there's a lot of organizations and associations and schools and, you know, those kind of organizations that we work with. And then also the fighters themselves tend to have those networks. So we work a lot with people who've gone through the program. Um, who do you know that looks like you, that you know wants to build a company this way, has an idea, you know, and I think those are, they're often recommending some really great people as well. What are some things you begin uh, by teaching? Uh, someone, who, someone who maybe has an idea, but has no idea what it means to be an entrepreneur, what that, like how to even start, because there's a hundred steps you can take as a first step, I, I, I suppose. So how do you begin that? So I think up until now, um, the, the fighters program has, we've been doing it kind of in the workshops around kind of the basics really of, um, you know, what is funding? What is setting up a company? What is hiring an employee? Um, and so I don't think it should come as a shock that, you know, th that's what we're teaching, um, just to make sure that people are really on the same page. But what's incredible is that I don't think, you know, we need to teach, um, I feel like today there's kind of like a playbook. Is it is it lean canvas or I don't know what it is, but I do find that uh, the fighters in some cases, they, they solve problems very differently. And I think that's a benefit. I actually think that, you know, they're maybe addressing different problems and they should also feel free to address them in their own way. So we don't teach everything and we do that intentionally. That was going to be my next question. Can you teach it too much? Can you sort of, uh, <laughs> is there like a cookie cutter method that you can easily uh, I think there is. Okay. I think, yeah. and I think yeah. it's a problem. I think the day that we have all companies building exactly the same way, uh, we have a huge, huge problem. Yeah, you need room for creativity as well. And, and usually the biggest stories are the ones that come up from outside the box. Someone someone created the, the first page in the playbook that everyone will be copying. And, and if no one is creating yeah. the playbook, then at some point the book will be pretty boring. Yeah. <laughs> Creativity is an interesting space. It's that space between like something doesn't exist, but it, it there's a, there's an, there's like an in, invisible space somewhere in the world where it, like there's a, there's a, like a snug fit place for this one thing, but it just, just doesn't exist yet. It's really a crazy thing. It's the same with music, movies, books, yeah. companies, <clears throat> very weird thing. How, how do people hit that vein? Uh, yeah, very, very, very interesting. Anyway, that's yeah. not a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. But let's, uh, let's formulate like this. So uh, if you have a more like the more established company route, so let's say I have a company idea, something like I want to create a, I don't know, a genetically manipulated manipulated tree that can capture carbon, so it grows in one year and then it captures Look more carbon. And, oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. And then uh, I wanna I wanna apply. So what kind of fundamentals do you do? Does that company need to have in place? And then after we get in with this great business idea, what uh, will you you know, teach us or uh, what will we start going through? Is it a systematic process or yeah? Um, I just found it funny that you picked this example because we have a company at Station F. Uh, they've come out of the Entrepreneur First program called Neoplant and they actually develop plants that can metabolize more pollutants. So it's a very good example. Yeah, people laughed at me um, when I said that sometime, but I think it's a good idea still. I think it's a very good idea. Uh, so yeah, we um, it, it depends on the program. So as I mentioned, there's 30 of them and each program has different criteria um, when they select, but majority of them are looking for a full-time team, a working prototype, um, maybe some proof of concept. So you have users, customers, what have you. Um, and then whatever industry or you know specificity specificity they have for their program um you like for example we have uh, maybe an ai program you would have to respond to the ai criteria you know that kind 
and stuff. But actually, I can give you a bit more detail on how we select for the Founders Program, which is one of the two programs that my team runs. So we run Fighters and Founders. Founders is for um, all sectors, early stage only across like around the world. So you could be from anywhere and apply to this. But we are looking for the elements that I just mentioned. We're also looking for usually technical experience within the team. Um, we're looking for a fast uh, growth. So we don't want some, I mean, we have sometimes people who apply, they launched the company, you know, five years ago and they're getting their first customer today. We don't, that's not something that we're super interested in. Um, we're looking at people with a fast mindset. And actually we have a network of over a hundred entrepreneurs around the work, world that help us evaluate the idea. So my team is actually filtering the basic criteria, but then these entrepreneurs are looking at, is this an idea we've seen 20 times, one time? Is, is there a huge need in the market? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Does this look like a credible team to solve the problem they're going after? Uh, so that's the stuff that they're actually looking at. And I think a lot of programs probably select kind of in a similar way. I'd say EF is probably, and the fighters program, the only one, the only program that you can show up without a real company, without a real team, and they help you get started. Uh, I guess in some, this this is a 10 year old question, but, but uh, I guess it's still relevant in some ways. Like the startup campus is uh, slush maybe even, I mean, these are all, Kind of global litmus tests for startup capitalism, even like this type of uh, uh, the the scene in a sense. Like uh, I remember five years ago, we have another podcast. We were talking about um, with this Finnish economist who said, like, yeah, I mean, we have slush and everything, but is it really showing in the GDP? Is it really doing anything? It was an open question back then. So, kind of giving you that same question now, like uh, Station F is kind of a litmus test what how do you how do you see it happening do you see it like having an impact in the world and and uh and uh and doing good i mean i wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case right, right? so i think obviously uh, your question kind of tilts at how do we measure success for station f and yes obviously we follow some of the kpis that the ecosystem follows even though they're not perfect indicators of success um, you know, for example, how much funding is raised, uh, what companies are getting acquired, how many companies are failing, uh, how many jobs are created. Like these are things that we're obviously looking at and following. But I do actually think um, the real litmus test for me on the value is is really the fighters program in a way, because I think we have a huge risk. Um, especially in France. I don't know if this is the case across Europe, but there has kind of been a, a political discourse around startup nation and trying to get a lot of people to create businesses. And obviously that will boost the economy. And I totally on board with all of that. But it, a lot of people feel like this is addressed at a certain part of the population. They feel like it's addressed at people with an MBA, people who've gone to business school, engineering school, what have you. And that's not the majority of people. So that is really why the fighters program is so important for us. Um, and also, we need to solve real problems. And there is also this feeling or the sentiment when you talk to people outside of the startup community that we're building, you know, an app that doesn't really solve a real problem. And so I think that's why we need to bring in people um, from everywhere to build companies and to show them it's not impossible. You can do it um, or you can join a company. And I think that's that's the real litmus test for me. Yeah. And it, it seems also like uh, people from different backgrounds who have experienced some of those issues trying to be solved firsthand and not just read about them should be more passionate passionate about those problems and more capable of then actually going for, for the solution. So. Yeah. It seems like it's a very overlooked demographic for solving solving actual problems. So, um, yeah, let's hope uh, that program will be a huge huge success. But on paper, <laughs> it sounds like a very good idea, at least. Yeah, no, because that, that was a very very good way of phrasing an answer to that question. Um, like, are, what are do you have like a list of of, of, of KPIs or just how, what's your measure of success? What do you think is the purpose behind Station F? Um, well, so I think, like I mentioned, we're obviously following a lot of the indicators that the ecosystem follows. Right, so of course. funding yeah. raised, jobs created, who's getting acquired, exits. Um, so I think like a lot of these indicators are also indicators of business success. So that's what we look at as well. But in reality, the real indicator of success is just does your company generate revenue? <laughs> is it still alive and standing? And does it create some kind of value that people want to purchase? Um, 
Beyond that, however, I do think that Station F plays a role but needs to continue to play a role in guiding companies in terms of the values that they have and the, the real value that they create for the society. If we just have companies walking in the door because they generate revenue and only that criteria, I consider it a failure because these are companies that we believe need to represent the future. And if we're only looking at what makes money for our future, I think it's going to be a really dark place. So that's why we are also looking at how do these companies respect, um, you know, Envi the environment, how do they respect diversity, how do they tackle some of these real big problems. And that's why our selection criteria gets us six to nine percent of companies that apply, even though we're turning away sometimes some really incredible businesses just because they don't fit into that that model that we're going after. Yeah, I'm curious uh, to, to start rounding up here, but um, since you have a wide uh, range of companies and, and you, you know, you see a lot of entrepreneurs and you also have the benefit of seeing, um, as we spoke about different kinds of entrepreneurs, uh, and then you also have, on the other hand, you have like these certain keywords that are associated with great entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs like grit and, you know, passion and uh, working hard and all that kind of stuff. Have you found some even surprising characteristics that define some of the great entrepreneurs you've seen come through the programs? Some that aren't maybe, you know, the stereotypical things you would find on any blog about becoming an entrepreneur? Um, surprising? Um, that's that's hard because... Like lazy or something. Like, no. <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> that's probably not... Yeah. The not, best not, ones not are lazy. Ones. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So I think actually probably... Um, the really funny thing is that, I mean, often I feel like we want to generalize and we want to say like, what is that one trait? And I really feel like it's so much about individuals. It's really about your personal story. Like I think the, the best example I can think of is um, one of our entrepreneurs who's gone through the fighters program is a, he's building a company called digital and they make anti-theft devices for cars, but he's a former car thief. So who better to build this business? Um, he knows his topic inside out. He's got a hacker mindset and, you know, he's somebody that when he walked in the door, we were all like, yes, he's super credible for what he wants to do. But the problem that he's going to face is a lot of, um, institutional investors won't be able to give him money. You know, he's going to, he's going to struggle, but he's actually, you know, beyond the idea that he has and the technical experience that he has. He's a captivating person. You just want to be around him. You just like he's and you want to work for him. And that's that is something that I find um, more and more common in the entrepreneurs that we see succeed. And he's actually doing very well. He's managed to secure funding despite all the hurdles. So I think, you know, it's that hacker, that hacker kind of uh, grit that people have. And um, and maybe it's just like some kind of charisma that just we call it passion, but I think it's more than passion. I think it's actually being able to kind of elude your passion so that people are just like, yes, I, sh I share that with you, you know, and they want to jump on board. Yeah, I think that's a great, great that answer. Yeah. And what a great way to start to pitch. I used to yeah. be a car thief, <laughs> so I should know. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. That's uh, that's a bit of a different one. Yeah, definitely credible is a good word. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. uh, you've invested with uh, Atomico uh, also as an angel. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel your experience scouting and scanning through all, all these startups and, and working with them has helped you invest or is it still as hard to you know find good uh, startup companies to invest in? Or not necessarily to yeah. find the good companies, but to pick them and, and then you know actually be a successful angel investor because it's uh, by all accords very very hard yeah so actually i started with atomico when it was the first batch that they did 2018 and then um, now i'm doing with sequoia and i've also done a few personal investments and just it's early days for me as an investor so i don't have any unicorns or anything like that to share um but i do think that it's very different um it's a very different interaction with a company 
I mean, you're really looking at having more skin in the game. Um, entrepreneurs also often share a lot more. I mean, you can really get personal about topics that I feel like sometimes in, in some of the programs, um, you only just hit the surface. And so you can really dive deep. And, and that's something I'm, I really am liking a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, I think Station F has been kind of a really good um launch pad for it, I would say. But I would I think that being invested investing in companies, you go much, much deeper. And I'm I'm finding it really fascinating. Yeah. Amazing. That is, sounds really, really nice. And uh thanks so so much for for joining the show and uh for all the, the great insights and yeah, answers. Thank you. It's been a super pleasure. Thank you. Thanks guys. It's been great. And thanks to the all you guys at home listening and, and uh and viewing what a great way to do an outro but yes see you in the Super next good. next episode again and take care until then bye 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 bye